um, and help hello everyone online. I want to introduce Benny Kumar. Uh, Benny Kumar is a phenomenal attorney, just a phenomenal person, and he's also my friend. Um, and that's why he drove all the way up here um, in, in the middle of the week. So if you don't know about the Future Music Attorneys program, um, just a little bit of background. It's a program that we've had for five years. I started it five years ago um, because I had a lot of students reaching out to me. Um, hey, can I shadow you for a day? Can we do coffee? Can I intern with you? And I was taking on as many people as I could. Um, but eventually, I couldn't speak and sit with everyone. And then also, I don't know everything. So I wanted to create a resource for students that was essentially what I needed when I was a law student and when I started my practice because um, I had no resources. Well, actually, I had resources. I didn't know that I had resources. I didn't have any mentors. I really just had to figure it out on my own. Um, so I really hope that this program is that thing for you all and other students who are part of your program. Um, but, you know, as we go and after this program, please feel free to send us feedback. This program is for you. Um, and I want to make sure as we move into our sixth year that it is a program that is designed specifically your needs. So Vinny, could you introduce yourself to the people please? Uh, sure. Uh, like she said, my name is Vinny Kumar. Um, I'm with a law firm called Kanaili Kumar. It's just me, one other attorney, and uh, a few associates at this point. Um, some background about me, I actually started out in music, so I was writing music, I was producing music when I was 17, and uh, was very close to, <laughs> both my parents are doctors, so they were really pushing me into the sciences, and I kind of wanted to stay in music somehow, and like took the MCATs, and then the next month took the LSATs, and then decided to just switch gears completely. Um, but uh, I worked, worked with Teddy Riley at his uh, studio down in Virginia Beach, kind of doing a bunch of different odds and ends, doing recording, uh, looking over contracts, et cetera. Uh, worked at Slip and Slide Records down in Miami um, in doing their business affairs stuff. Um, Universal Music Publishing and their legal and business affairs department down in Miami, which is funny because I'm actually not fluent in Spanish at all. And I had to do, we had a bunch of contracts in English, but then we would have certain territories where the contracts were only in Spanish. And I just had to kind of figure it out. So I think Google Translate was around at the time. So Listen, that was... Google is your friend. <laughs> I, I always say that and, and truly believe that. Yeah, so, I mean, but imagine learning it, like, at that point, you know, but in a different language. It was crazy. Um, but the contracts are pretty much all the same. So Okay, so everybody made it through. Yeah, They yeah. survived it. I've survived it. Um, what else? Uh, so then I moved up to Atlanta and just kind of took a chance, wanted to start my own practice and uh, my law partner Scott Kniley gave me a chance um, and gave me an umbrella for my law firm and kind of just ever doing that ever since and now I'm also legal counsel for a company called Empire Distribution. So, so what kind of work are you doing? Well what kinds of clients do you represent and then what kind of work are you doing? Um, clients all across the board. I'm, uh, producers, writers, artists, um, record companies also, um, sometimes I would say managers, uh, booking agents, pretty much have clients all on both sides, you know, so people may want to start a certain type of company, um, then you also have the other side of it, so you kind of see it from all angles. And, then, and so with this particular group of people, or types of clients, what kinds of deals are you talking about? Um, well, you know, but a bunch of the deals that we see every day, um, uh, producer uh, agreements with the artists um, from either side. Uh, I'm seeing recording deals, publishing deals, touring agreements, um, uh, merchandising agreements. What else? Uh, these days, since I've been working with Empire Distribution, they're primarily a digital music aggregator. So uh, it's been kind of cool to look at the agreements with all of these new digital retailers like SoundCloud, uh, iTunes, uh, Beats, you know, all of these companies. Um, so you, you see a variety of, of agreements. 
So the, the theme for today's panel is music lawyers, entrepreneurship, and building a brand. So that covers like a lot of stuff. <laughs> and so we, we kind of got to look into, you know, what you were doing as a music lawyer representing the talent, some of the, uh, the companies that may be signing the talent, the types of deals that you're working with. And you mentioned earlier that you, you're a music person. Yeah. So as far as you being a music person, because you know I'm a music person too, yeah. it's like my thing. Um, how much of you being a music person goes into you know what you do and how you do what you do? I, for me, it, it, it actually goes into a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten advice before that if you are a entertainment lawyer, you are a lawyer. You know, and that is that is it. So don't really consider the music too much. But I, I do take a little bit of a different approach. Um, because I've always been into music for a long time. So a lot of times I'll give clients my feedback if they want it, you know, I'll also give them suggestions on how I think, not just from a legal aspect, but from just a promotional aspect, like what they should do to get heard, what they should do to get their music out there, um, how to, uh, j just different ways they can even monetize their content and also different creative ways to promote themselves right so and I would say you know being a music person that happens to be a music lawyer and that's how I like to, to frame it when I'm talking to people because people say oh lawyers you know lawyers we think things of lawyers and some of it may tr be true right um so in the music space I like to tell people that I'm a music person who happens to be a music lawyer and it kind of levels the, the conversation it, it, it creates a bit more warmth to the conversation um, and also, you know, to what you were saying, because I am a music person, we're having conversations that extend, you know, that go far beyond the paperwork. Right. Um, and then also because we're music people, um, we tend to be more involved in the client and can have a creative conversation with the client and also apply it to the actual work that we're that we're doing. Um, so if you aren't a music person, mm -hmm. but you still want to do, you know, want to be a music lawyer, would you agree that um, this is something that you will want to enjoy mm -hmm. and that if, you know, if you don't enjoy this, it's not great. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause you know, <laughs> talk a little bit about just the, um, what the perception is of the music space and then what it really is and what the challenges are, you know, have been for you. Sure. Well. Sure. I mean, I was, uh, I was in, when I went to university of Miami, I was in the entertainment and sports law society vice president. So, you know, I, I saw, there were tons of people in the group like when we first started yeah. and it kind of it kind of whittled down to be honest like it started at like 100 the first day and then it was like 10 by the last uh by the last meeting but um it's it's it is like a really difficult field but i don't want to discourage anybody from entering into it because it's a lot of fun if you know it's a lot of fun um but i think that uh I'm, I am answering your question. Yes, correctly, yeah, right? you, are, you are. Can you rephrase it one more time? Just just, so you know, sure. uh, the per there's a perception of the music space, mm -hmm. and then we know what it actually is, right, right. and what are the, what have been the challenges for you, whether right. personally, professionally, and being in the music space. That's not complex. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I think, you know, when I first got out of law school, um, I had some experience, and coming out, I thought I could. I thought I could build a practice, hopefully, pretty easily because I knew a lot of people in the music space. But I think uh, you're you're also dealing with a lot of starving artists as well, right? So if you're just coming out of law school in college and you have all these student loans, it's super hard to pay your bills uh, without building a not just a, a pretty big clientele base, but also some that are actually making money. Um, so that was that was kind of the main challenge for me. I mean, I, I tell a lot of new attorneys that it took me probably about four or five years to really start making any significant money. It got to the point where my parents looked at me and they were like, why are you not working for a law firm? And I was like, don't worry, trust me. And literally one month later is when a bunch of the artists that I was working with started to uh, have a lot of success <laughs> so and that's that was my same experience and um you know to to your you know to your point about you know the music industry not you know being glamorous and it's it's a difficult space um it's a difficult space even for the lawyers um you know we graduate you know we, we've gone through law school would you think you paid your dues with that right mm -hmm. <laughs> good lord um but you know it's just the beginning and then you take the bar which is 
the matrix, but you survive it. Um, and then you you go out and you try to start your own practice. And you know, for me, it was I had to learn how to be a lawyer. I had to learn how to be a, a, a music lawyer. I had to learn how to be a, a voice and a person within the music space. Uh, I was young. I was a female. There was all these things, and I had to learn how to really build that within the uh, within the space. But ultimately. Um, what I've noticed to be true about talent in the music space, I noticed to be true about myself as a lawyer, is that this is a thing of endurance. And in law school, if you have law, you know, law students in this room, you know what endurance is. Um, you know, it's going and going and going and studying and going and pushing yourself, pushing, pushing, pushing. It's the same thing for, for me in this space. I can't speak you know, to, to other lawyers in other industries, but this is a thing of absolute endurance. It is a, a mental, spiritual, outside of your skill set. Um, it's, you know, what are you doing in the music space as a lawyer, keeping up with the times, keep, keeping up with the talent, um, the creative culture. It's an endurance thing. Just like I would tell clients, like, listen, you know, you may have all the talent in the world, but if you're not out there building the ship and making it sail, it doesn't matter. It's an endurance thing. And that's why I believe you can hear people on the radio or see people that are pretty successful or peers that way, and they don't have much talent. You know, it's like, well, I know this person that has all this talent, and they can't seem to, you know, put one foot in front of the other. It's an endurance thing. And I think the same thing applies, um, you know, for us, because there have been many times where, you know, I couldn't see past what was in front of me, and you have to really figure it out. Yeah. Um, you know, you're looking at contracts in Spanish. You figure it out. Yeah, and, uh, and we, uh, Avita and I, I think for years, we've been bouncing ideas off of each other. Like if we didn't know something, then I would send her a, a, a paragraph and I'd say, Avita, what do you think about this? And how can we fix this, yes. you know? And I mean, we've done that so many times over the years. I think I think that's something important just to have like peers that you're working with or, or that you have a good relationship with just to bounce ideas off of. Because sometimes, um, and the other thing, you should definitely have a mentor for sure, but sometimes your mentors are not always available to answer every single question that you have, and you will have a lot of them you know, coming out. And I think the takeaway from that is um, you can figure it out. Um, I would say the first several years of my career, and even now, um, it's figuring it out um, and, and seeing what sticks. And so what you were saying earlier, and this gets us into the entrepreneurship piece, um, is starting out, there is no money. Yeah. There, I mean, in this particular industry, unless you go and you work for, um, you know, a firm or a large firm, a small firm that practices in this area, um, there's just not money there waiting for you, and you have to go out and create opportunities. And and what my position is, you know, whether you're starting your own firm or whether you're going into a, a firm that you know that has a, a practice area in entertainment, music, I think you should be entrepreneurial minded. Um, you should still be looking to create opportunities within the space. And so talk about, so you said the first four or five years, you know, it took you to kind of get your rhythm and your stride. That is the same for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no cutting corners. Um, it just wasn't, but I learned so much and it had been experimenting those, those years, um, as well. So talk about a bit more about the point where there was the four or five years and then things opened. What was that? I think, well, it was just it was just me working. It's an endurance thing, right? It was just me working with clients that I thought had um, the ability for success and just kind of like waiting it out and just working with everybody. Because uh, I don't know if you all know it, but entertainment law lawyers, they, uh, they bill in a few different ways. Um, some of them do a, a, your traditional retainer, uh, but not a lot of them. Some of them do like a flat fee arrangement for contracts, and then uh, it's a, a lot of them also do um, percentage deals. So, and then also a lot of the clients expect, I think, a lot of lawyers to do it to to work on a percentage, um, which you can't always do. You know, not everybody is necessarily going to make it. So you kind of have to pick and choose a little bit if you're going to do those deals, and if you are going to do those deals, you have to really think, am I ever going to get paid from this? Yeah, and um, and because you know I am an entrepreneur, what I realized earlier on is that you know just because I put my retainer at five thousand dollars doesn't mean that people can't pay that, and right. they just have that waiting there. Um, you know, for you, 
So being an entrepreneur, what I had to do was say, okay, I've got different kinds of clients mm -hmm. with different uh, types of needs. Not everybody needs uh, a lawyer or retainer. Not everybody needs me to do stuff, you know, a ton of stuff. Maybe it's just a one-off. So I, you know, I incorporate the percentage basis. I incorporate the flat fee basis and for clients that can pay the retainer. Um, you know, you do. And this is not a legal thing. This is outside of being a lawyer. This is a being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, um, which took me a while to learn. But you know, this is what we have to do, you know, in the music space. So yeah, and if you're and if you if you're approaching it from that entre entrepreneurial uh, aspect, then you kind of want to think about how you can differentiate differentiate yourself from other entertainment lawyers. You know, um, so is there maybe one particular thing? that you specialize in, whereas other people don't, you know? Um, uh, you know, or maybe you, maybe you just wanna have other things that you do focus on in addition to entertainment law. Um, when I came out, I was kind of doing, uh, <clears throat> I was doing corporate law, but then I started also doing trademarks and copyrights, so we were getting a lot of trademarks that we were filing, and um, I, I started doing a lot of, uh, which is completely not even, it doesn't seem like it's in the realm, but I started doing a lot of immigration work as well. Um, and it was kind of paying the bills for a little while. Um, but it all, but now I would say it makes it interesting because if uh, somebody comes to me as an artist with an immigration issue, then I can help with the getting like an O, o visa, you know, if they're from out of the country and they want to come over here. Um, or even just dealing with some of their, you know, their travel and things like that. You know? And so you've kind of hit on two points. You hit on the entrepreneurial piece, um, and then you also hit on the building brand piece. So let's talk about uh, getting the bills paid, because we've already said when you first start, there just is no, there just is no money. Right. Um, and so I'm a big believer when students ask me, and I always tell them to, to ask other people, because I'm so far left in my opinion on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I graduated with a ton of debt, law school debt. I refuse to let my debt be my 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 guide mm -hmm. um, as far as the career choice or just my life. And I know for a lot of students, um, they're very concerned about that, about all this debt. I need to go somewhere. Um, I need to you know get these loans paid off. I need to be you know pay my bills. Let me go you know practice in a firm. What are your thoughts on um, I guess just kind of debt and there not being any any money in the music space when you first start? How do you what would you recommend a student to kind of balance when, when considering their options? Uh, I mean, in my opinion, I think it's kind of what I was saying a little bit before, but I would try to, number one, find a, a, a particular niche uh, for yourself. And then I would also say, don't be closed-minded about the type of entertainment law you're practicing. Um, my law partner has always said this. He said that you're not, when you're an entertainment lawyer, you're not just doing strictly entertainment paperwork you know there's other issues that come up i get people who call me for we were talking about for criminal issues i mean i i got a call like that two days ago somebody was like i you know they were telling me about how they just got pulled over and they were asking me questions about that i get tax questions i get the immigration questions i get pretty much family law questions everything else so what i would say is um Try to try to also have something else, like another path that you work in while you're building your entertainment practice or while you're building that entertainment specialty. Um, and it don't look at don't look at it like, oh no, I'm straying away from entertainment in any way because all of that stuff is useful. Like if I could have gone back, my my uh, I guess my education or experience was working in a studio and then working uh, in house at a couple labels which is great experience for the entertainment industry, but it's not very good when you get out in the real world and somebody's saying, you know, that they have some sort of criminal issue or they have some sort of issue where somebody's getting sued or anything like that. So I think that being well-rounded is very important. So if you could still work for uh, a law firm that does, you know, other types of things as well or, um, you know, or anything like that. I think I think it'll all be beneficial, and you can still build a, a practice. You just have to kind of in your spare time head out and try to meet as many people as possible in the music space. And if you're stubborn like I am, 
and you don't want to do anything else with this, <laughs> um, let me let me tell you kind of what I did. And, and there's going to be some sacrifice involved. Um, you know, it's going to be about sacrifice, and it's going to be about planning to the extent that you can. I'm not a great planner, but I did have some sort of plan. Um, and then figuring out how to double yourself. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, so for me, and you know, if you've heard the story before, I'll tell it again because it, it's something that I always carry with me when I first started my practice. I moved back home with my parents. I was a lawyer, <laughs> um, but I was at home with my parents. I was a full blown adult, but I was at home with my parents, whom I love very, very much. They're great people. Um, so that was me saying, okay, this is a sacrifice I'm going to take. You know, while a lot of my friends and classmates had these amazing jobs with amazing pay. I was at home living with my parents trying to figure it out. That's the first thing. And then let's talk about my car. My car was very, very cool in college. Fast forward many, many moons later, it was struggling. It would make noise. And my dad was like, you have to get a new car. We are afraid for you. And I was like, I'm not going to get a new car. It still goes. <laughs> it's paid for. I'll just put some gas in it. And then, you know, my parents were cooking dinner, so I had lunch. So that was my... Okay, I have no money. I have to figure it out. So I'm just gonna move here. We're gonna pray that the car makes it from point A to point B, and then we're we're good. So that was definitely a sacrifice there. What I did do, um, I took on random projects here and there for a uh, document review. Uh, so some law firms, what they do is they they may have these big litigation projects, and they'll hire an agency to bring in some lawyers or some paralegals or something to look over all of these documents for litigation. Thousands, hundreds of thousands, and you sit there and you code them and it's just all of this stuff and it's not interesting at all. But what I did, I would get there at six o'clock in the morning and then I would leave at about two or three and then I would go to my office, my very first office, which was super sketchy, but it was in Buckhead, so that balances out a little bit, I guess. Um, and, and so that's what I did, but these were, you know, random projects, maybe it would be for four weeks or six weeks. I think the last one I did, I actually walked out two days, you know, before it was over because I just couldn't anymore. Um, so that's me being stubborn, but I say all that to say, there are ways to make this work. Um, I do know people who've gone into law firms who want to do entertainment and they get sucked into the matrix so you know if that's something that you do you know get your money but have your plan do your job at the law firm double yourself and build your practice it's an endurance thing it's how yeah. bad do you want it thing and it's possible and it will look different you know for everyone but you know don't get stuck in the firm matrix. I know people who've been there for a very long time, and being an entertainment lawyer just kind of becomes this distant memory, you know. But again, it's you know, how bad you want it. There are ways to get there and to make it happen. Yeah, um, it might be, it might even be just going to events, you know. Even if you're working and doing a different, completely different kind of law, there's still you know, events that are put on by the Recording Academy and then BMI, ASCAP, CSEC. They all have different events. Um, and then there's also just festivals. There's South by Southwest and all these other things. Um, if you can just make it out to some of these things, they're incredible networking opportunities. A lot of, a lot of these events also have uh, really good panels with people, not just lawyers, but also music executives, A&Rs, uh, managers, everybody else. So you can kind of start forming those relationships and a lot of those people they'll just work with you i mean you should do good work of course but if they like you too like they're just going to start sending things your way eventually so i mean that's definitely happened with me and i'm sure it's happened with yeah. Vita over the years like i just have people who are just like you know i like working with you let's keep working and they've sent me five six seven other clients yeah you know? i mean and you know as you as you plant your seeds and um, and this is a point I wanted to make earlier, you know, when you said four or five years, things opened up for you. And for me, four or five years, things opened up for me. But starting at day one, I planted seeds that got me to that opening yeah. up point. So, you know, even if you aren't where you want to be, and I think this is just in like period, it's a philosophy I have, what you do every single day plants a seed for ultimately for where you will be. So be mindful of the seeds that you plant every single day. You know, you may be feeling challenged or it's a gloomy day, you just don't see it, but you are in position to plant a seed that will grow into something that you can stand on later. I truly, truly, truly believe that. 
and to your uh, to your point earlier um, about having a, a having a niche. Um, how do you you know make yourself uh, stand out from the, the crowd of the other lawyers? Um, and this goes into our building a brand piece. I I always always say this. You know, you are a brand even as you sit in seats. You have a thing that makes you you, and that's your brand. So you have to find a way to build a platform for that. So for me, my brand is, you know, I am a music person before I am a lawyer. Don't forget about the music. I am going to be the lawyer on the soapbox about music, musical integrity. I'm going to fight for the, my clients, you know, musical value, all of these things. It's music, music, music for me. So now when I go out, people are like, oh, aren't you a lawyer? Don't forget about the music. Oh, I've heard about you. Music, music, music. That is my thing and we all have this thing and you build a platform for it. Social media is huge for me. I get to go online for free whenever I want to and I get to communicate my brand and the people that are attracted to it or interested in it, they they engage it, but it's that thing. And I know that my brand is my brand and if I no longer work with you or if you go to another lawyer, you won't get that thing anywhere else and i think it's important as students to kind of research that or pull that out or start to build a platform for that because that's going to make all of the difference if you go out to the festivals and the concerts and you're meeting people i have two recommendations one show up and you know provided you are an actual lawyer i'm a music lawyer tell people what you want people to know i am a music lawyer and then when they send you something you figure it out um tell people you know who you are and then communicate to them who you are so that when you walk away from them, they have a sense of who you are and can articulate it. Hey, I'm Ben Finney, he's a really great guy, he's a music lawyer, this is his brand. Um, and that's what's gonna make the difference. That's what's going to cause people to bet on you without even really knowing what you can do. Yeah. People will take a chance on you, but you have to be visible and you have to articulate Brand. Yeah, and, and I would say also, you all have a lot of uh, tools at your disposal, especially with there being so many social networks and different ways of communicating with people. So, I mean, I'll just give you the example. For me, personally, you know, I was tweeting, I, I was literally, I, what I was doing, I was just uh, blogging about music that I liked, you know? So I, would, I started a blog, and then it's now it's kind of defunct. But at the time, though, it was actually really useful. I would put up songs that I liked, but it was a lot of work. Every day, I would spend like, I would wake up super early, and I would spend like an hour and a half on this blog. Or over the weekend, I would just spend like a whole day setting up for the whole week, and then I would have music up every day. But not just music, but I'd put, you know, just strange, random stuff from Japan, or then I'd put like cool houses that I liked and other things on the blog. Um, and I would, whenever I posted something from a particular artist that I liked, I would tag them on, and then it would, it would pop up on Twitter for them. So, you know, when I was out at some of these festivals and I'd meet with some of these people, they would know, they would already know my name, even if they didn't know who I was, you know, or what I did. So I could introduce myself and say, they would say, oh, that sounds familiar. I, I know I've heard your name somewhere. Where do I know you from or something? But a lot of times it was just something simple like that. Or um, even now, a little different, but sometimes I'll be on Instagram and I'll, uh, somebody, like like I also work in the visual artist space a lot now, um, so a particular artist that I'm following, I might comment on certain things or I might like certain things or whatever, and then when I run into them, it's kind of the same thing. They've already seen my name before, they kind of have an idea at least of who I am or something, so it, it, it helps, it definitely helps. And, and a lot of these people will remember things you would not even think they would remember. So it's pretty interesting. And I like that you brought that you did a, a music blog. That's something that you're just naturally interested in is music and talking yeah. about it. And so bring that to the space as well. What are you naturally interested in? How can you bring it to the space? I am not the person that can walk into an event and just <coughs> flow through the room. I am socially awkward, right? That's that's just my truth. But I do love speaking and teaching and, and motivating if I can, which is why I have this program, which is why you know I do tons of panels and teaching and lecturing. I'm just naturally interested in that, but the fact that I can do that 
stand in front of a group of people who are there to learn and talk about something that I love, I mean, it's just, it makes up for all the parties and the events that I won't go to because I'm just awkward. Um, but it creates a level of, of visibility. I am a writer. I am, you know, releasing a book. That is something I'm naturally interested in and I'm bringing to the space. So as you're building your brand and you're finding that thing that makes you you, just think about what you're interested in and bring it to the space yeah. because it will make it fun for you. Um, we have very challenging challenging days we have lots of demands lots of things that we need to do i feel like i can get everything done through four of me but what pushes me and what makes it fun and, and i can embrace the challenge is that I, I i'm doing something that i love i'm interested in this and i'm tapping into all of my gifts and talents and it's beyond just <clears throat> a contract yeah yeah exactly and I, that's what uh, building off of that i would say yeah focus on what you really like, what you're really interested in, what you're passionate about, because turns out you may you may find a completely like a space there where nobody else is really tapping into. You know, I met this one girl once who uh, she her she I met her at one of the entertainment law conferences, and she said, "I want to be a lawyer for people on cooking shows." You know, mm -hmm. and that was her that was her thing, like that was her focus, and I was like, "Oh." That's crazy because I don't really know anybody who does that. And if it ever came up, I would probably refer somebody to I think her. Steve Simon does it. He mm -hmm. that's like a niche for him. Oh, really? Um, okay. Like he represents all the people that win the shows and open up restaurants. That's so crazy. They, I mean, it's like his. He's that guy. Yeah. Um, that's that's yeah. funny. And then you know, and then me personally, like I was saying, I do some of the visual artist stuff. It's just something I'm completely just interested in. And a lot of these guys, they they don't have any lawyers or anything right. like that. So. You know, and it's, I guess you, you know, you're always learning in law school to watch out about like direct solicitation and stuff like that, you yeah. know, so, um, but I, I, I kind of do it the way you said, I just say, this is what I do. Nice to meet you. And then if they, they'll know what you do and they'll know who you are and they may just contact you. Yeah. So. And, and your, your work, your brand and how you treat people will travel so far. So, I mean, just even now, be yeah. kind to people. It's a tough space. Be kind to people. Yeah. You know, it matters. That, that's something that, that's like the, probably the first piece of advice I heard when I was in the music industry. Um, because a lot of people that might even just be an intern, you know, with you at a record label or something like that, they get into completely different positions over their course of their career. And you never know, you know, you might need them one day, even though they're just helping you right now, you know. Yeah. And I and I just think, um, you know, it's a life principle. We wake up every day and, and, you know, days are challenged. There's a lot of stuff that we have to deal with. And um, even though it's a very colorful space that we're in, um, being kind just makes things peaceful. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. And when you choose a position of just kindness, you know, treating your clients with kindness, um, you know, building that brain and communicating it, and, you know, having that endurance, you can do it. So we've covered kind of music lawyers, entrepreneurship, and building a brand. Do we have any questions? Yes, Julie. So I wanted to know why you picked Atlanta versus New York, LA, Miami, where you did some work. <coughs> what brought you to Atlanta? And do you think it was a good choice now looking back? I, I do now, yeah, looking back, absolutely. Um, I think at the time, I was just kind of doing it because I thought there was a lot of competition everywhere else. So I thought there would probably be a lot of entertainment lawyers in LA, lots of them in New York. And Miami, I felt like was not completely good for me because I didn't, I wasn't bilingual. Well, I am in a different, in an Indian language, but, um, but not in Spanish. So I just thought, you know what, let me, let me just try it out in Atlanta. Um, I know it are, they already have a lot of entertainment attorneys in Atlanta, but why not? Why not? If I'm going to give it a shot somewhere, might as well just pick a place and do it. You know. And, and I would build on that. Um, I hadn't really thought too much about the other places, the, the New Yorks and the LAs, um, because at that point, I think uh, I graduated in 2006. The music was still here. You know, it, it was still, it, it wasn't here as much as it had been, you know, prior to 2006, but it was still kind of here and I hadn't quite grasped what was happening 
with music just you know at that point but what i can say is um i've been able to build a brand benny's been able to build a brand in a smaller pond um how long have you been doing this for it's been eight years for me yeah you you yeah i mean since 2005. so and i and i think i've been able to in my mind I don't know whether it's true. I think it might be, but I don't know. You know, if somebody says, hey, I'm looking for a music lawyer and they're in Atlanta, I'd like to think that I come up in the top five. Um, I don't know that I have been a would have been able to do that so soon in the larger markets. And then also, I find that in New York and in LA, it's really kind of the land of maybe the firms with about 10, 15 plus lawyers yeah. and then the larger ones. And Atlanta seems to be more of the land of the, the solo practitioner or you know, maybe two lawyers. Um, so that culture was here, but it's a it's a smaller pond where you can make an impact, an impact that's a bit bigger and, and sooner rather than later. Good question? Um, yes, uh, my name is Kayla Pingy. I'm a 1L here at UGA and so the summer's coming up and I'm just trying to figure out like what could I do to like be in the media space, like go out to Apache in Atlanta or like what should I be doing? So your name's Kayla? Yes. So Kayla wants, this is for the people who may be watching, uh, Kayla wants to know, you know, what could she be doing this summer um, to put herself in the music space if she's finishing up her first year in law school. Um, you know, my recommendation is to be everywhere strategically. Um, one thing I always tell students, especially when you're in law school, the culture of law school is to look for a job and hang out with lawyers that may give you a job and happy hours. I mean, do that, okay, but understand that um, there's kind of two, two things here. You being the best music lawyer will be you being familiar with, this, with the space and the culture, knowing how people move and create um, and what the transactions are like course. Um, so the more you can learn there, the better you will, you will be in your craft. Um, but the, the second thing is all of these people who work in the music space, they deal with lawyers. So for me, my third year in law school, I interned at a record label. They didn't know why I was there. They were just like, fine, you want to come here, you're in law school, okay. And I would order lunch and I would, you know, take calls and I'd say, hey, let me see your, your contracts that you have there. Um, and they did. But they had an album release event for one of their acts, and I bring it into the lawyer for the act. I said, hey, do you need intern? She's like, I sure do. So there's other ways to get to the opportunities. You know, Don't let law school make you believe that you have to go this route, especially when it comes to entertainment, because you know I don't know how resourceful UGA is when it comes to this particular area of law. I know Emory was not very resourceful at that time. So you have to find ways to get into the, the 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 space to learn about it and also to to meet the lawyers who may give you the opportunities don't be afraid to work at a studio a record label publishing company rehearsal hall um you know any place where people are engaged in entertainment or music if you want to do television and film which is kind of outside outside the scope of this program some massive 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 market for that in atlanta i mean there's stuff everywhere i think yeah. it might be easier to do that than it is to find the music opportunities but every concert release festival studio anything that you can get to get there and don't just be there like show up and make sure people know that you're there and what you're looking to do yeah i mean like uh there's this one artist that i know in atlanta and he has a his hashtag is be everywhere and I literally mm. I see this guy everywhere and then he he looks at me and he's like you're everywhere and I'm like oh, that's oh, good. but but it, it's funny uh, it's just it's interesting but I, I would when I first got to Atlanta I've slowed down now but I used to be at everything literally everything I could think of I was going to it and um, I didn't let my work suffer because I would work during the day but then if it's in the evening if I had to be out I would be um, the uh, you know, and, and Navita was talking about maybe like working in a studio or something like that. That was my first thing I did uh, first summer after that that one L year. Um, I uh, I was calling Teddy Riley's studio. I'm from Virginia, so I was just I found the number to the studio and I called once and I asked yeah. if they needed interns and they said no. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, they said call back in a month and I called back for eight months. Yeah. And then finally they were like, oh. 
they're like, we need an, they called me actually at that point. They said, we need an intern. And that's, that's kind of how I got my start over there. But everybody has their own path, you know, at the same time, you may also want to work and get some experience somewhere at a law firm, you know, and do some of this, you know, on your free time, because when, wherever you work, you're always going to be missing something. So everybody's going to have their own unique experience. So uh, you'll learn it eventually, but it'll come as the issues come, I guess. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think the cool thing or the takeaway is that you can create that experience. So, yeah. you, know, you can go work in a law firm, but just know that once you leave there, you've got some other things that you need to do. Or you can go work in a music environment, um, and maybe part time with the lawyer. You can create it. Um, you just have to create it. Any other questions? <laughs>